there's no symphony orchestra unless it had like 2,000 players that could emulate what just happened right here. Isn't this fun? Hi there, my name is Trolls and welcome to yet another episode in Soundpaint. In today's video, we're gonna go deep into our aleatoric brass, also known as cage brass, if you use the corresponding 8 duo version or contact version of the library. But a handful of years ago, Colin O'Malley, my dear friend and I, went into an orchestral hall with the idea of recording the largest collection of orchestral effects ever done. In fact, we wanted to make it so big that we never really had to come back to revisit it. And I think combined between the three different libraries, the woodwinds, the brass, and the strings, we had over like 66,000 effects. So in this video here, it's gonna be impossible for me to demonstrate just how deep this library goes. But the way I'm thinking about doing it is to do a first part where I'm introducing you to the multi-samples. The brass in particular is unique in the aleatoric brass family because we recorded both multi-samples and effects. The idea was that the multi-samples could be used together with the effects, but what I explored inside of Soundpaint was that these are really good multi-samples. So in the first part of the video here, I just want to take you into the DAW and play a demo I've made, really trying to push the brass inside of Soundpaint and see how much more we can get out of it. One of the unique aspects about Soundpaint when I use it is that it's a freeing tool in the sense that I don't just have to think about samples as acoustic properties, but I can also synthesize them. I can make them into these sort of hybrid beasts, if you will. And I have about, I don't know, 20 instances of the brass in here where I've just taken it in different ways and mangled it and try to process it and make it like synthesized, hybrid, and sometimes acoustic as well. There's sort of a legato proportion where I'm playing a really complex solo with the brass. And even though we don't have legato in this particular library, it really sounds like beautiful legato brass because of the way the sound paint engine works. Okay, so we're inside of the DAW. Let me just play this demo I wrote here. It's 100% written in sound paint with only sound paint instruments. Uh, the primary amount of instruments are coming from the brass that's been modified and sometimes natural. There's also a couple of other instruments. I'll list them right here.
know, crazy stuff. Uh, let me take you through the very top of the demo here, just beginning with these sort of arcs. And if you notice in the UI here, these arcs are long because I'm using speed again. Speed allows me to control the length of any arc. So for example, if I go up here, it's pretty fast, down to normal. But we can go slower, real slow. All the dynamics. Just so many small nuances in the sound. When we slow down, we can hear things we can't hear with the normal ear. So that's how the composition starts. And then I thought it could be interesting as well to have sort of a classic da 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 da, -da kind of ostinato pattern, but take the brass and gradually make the staccato sort of more synthetic. So right now we're somewhere in the mold between natural and unnatural in the sort of twilight zone between acoustics and digital hybrid. And I love the idea of us pushing the instruments to become more than what they just are in their natural sort of state. Did you hear that? So in the beginning, they're kind of like a little bit filtered, and then it sort of slowly opens up as I'm moving the mod wheel. I thought of that as a, like a lotus flower opening up slowly and sort of try to emulate that motion and sound. If it's not abundantly clear from a lot of videos, I'm completely in love with the Juno 60 arpeggiators here. And because we ultra deep sample our synthesizers, you get all the small natural variations you get in old school analogs. And for me, there's just a prettiness to that that we don't get with the modern stuff. Um, I also added a little bit of a bass also coming from the Juno 60 here. One of my favorite bass sounds. It's just so warm and buttery, but in the perfect way. I remember Dave Smith telling me that the old school way of designing synthesizers was not like it is today, where it's all about potency. Today, you've got to fill out the entire spectrum of sound. In the old school way of thinking, the instruments were more designed to sort of serve a purpose in music, if you will. And the Juno here just really has a beautiful, non-intrusive bass. It's not like super deep, subwoofy, even though you can make that in sound paint easily. But the softness, the warmth, and that perfect frequency spectrum is really one of my favorite sounds. Um, you'll notice I've got a couple of hearts here because these are patches I keep coming back to. And in this case here, it's the main soft bass from our Juno 60 UDS. And then I also added a little bit of our ensemble glockenspiel and I added a little bit of our 1928 piano on top of the glockenspiel, just giving this beautiful melodic sound. So pretty, even just like for me, Listen to the way that last sound ended. You can hear a little bit of the pedal moving from the piano, but you can also hear the liveliness, the bubbliness of the whole of the seven piece glockenspiel ensemble. It's so sweet. The marriage of acoustics that way, when you find something like it could be a DX7 bell too, but there are certain groups of sounds that just belong really well together, glockenspiels and pianos being one of them. I'm sort of fascinated with the idea of using perfect sonic ingredients. For example here, how beautifully extravagant that we can play with glockenspiel ensembles and old vintage pianos, which is for free. We can play with a Juno 60, we can play with this brass ensemble. And for me, I sort of think about food in terms of music sometimes. If you make a meal with really good ingredients, the likelihood of making a great meal is higher because everything is just fresh and of the highest quality. That's how I think about sound paint as well. 
With that said, I added an 808 to be the sort of underlying drum machine underneath. And even though this thing is from the early 80s, I would still argue it has the best drum machine sound of all time. And it's a timeless classic, perhaps even in the sense we think of a Stradivarius for violence. The 808 is, I think, up there with the Model D and a few other instruments in terms of having a completely timeless quality. Like there's something absolutely brilliant and genius about these 15 whatever sounds it has in it. <laughs> So to me, I was surprised when I made this solo how realistic it sounded because it's really doing complex things that are normally hard to do with samples, like these fast repeated notes. And to me, quite frankly, I was surprised when I made this program here just how good these samples sound in sound paint and how playable they are. It's nearly impossible to do this in contact and that's because I can't do all the mangling and processing of the sound in the same way I can in sound paint here. Check this out. I mean, I would almost imagine this had like full legato and round robin capabilities with the legato as well. It's pretty hard to play this with normal samples. It's so tight. And it's just so fun and nimble and elastic to play. So when I did the solo, I was like, okay, I'm really gonna try to stretch what you can do with the solo. Da, 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 da kind of deal. Let me just isolate the solo here by itself. And at the very tail end of that sort of macado, staccato kind of solo, we also have these other deep breaths going up and eventually becoming a lead melody by themselves. This is using our sustains. And this program here is particularly potent, beginning here with a power sustain for the Decca tree, another power sustain for the wide, then we have our stack modes down here and then macados down here, all just the horns, but four layers playing together. And once you super enhance that inside of sound paint with a little bit of compression, a little bit of EQ, sort of bringing out the air, but also the power and the basses here, extra reverb just to give it an even more punch, you get somewhere where it's like, hmm, I'm starting to feel it. It's kind of wild, right? So in the beginning here, it's playing sustains in octaves. You'll see two notes here just playing in perfect octaves. And then it takes over and becomes a melody. And even when it comes to more sort of fast playing notions, you wouldn't normally equate a sustain patch being able to do something as nimble as this. Let me try to isolate that down here just to show what happens both with the nimbleness and also just using the pitch bender here, like, hey, we can bend sounds. And the reason this program works so well, both being able to do sustains, but also being able to play like full and even fast melodies, it's in part because we have the staccatos and the macados together with the sustains here, but there's also a lot of other small things happening. For example, on the EQ down here, you'll notice when I move the mod wheel here that I'm both increasing the basses and a little bit of air in the top. We saw that in one of the earlier programs as well, adding a little bit of compression and a little bit of reverb as well. But also here in the rack section here, it can be playing with things like offset, it can be playing with things like time, and the whole thing sort of combined just gives these more elastic, beautiful patches not to mention all the things that happens underneath the very engine 
as you may know, sound pain is an analog engine in its depth. So there's always small fluctuations in the sound, even when you think you have completely locked down and under control. We want to make software that's alive. We want to try to Frankenstein our cold DAWs back to life, emulating a little bit of what we learned through the analogs, but also trying to build something entirely new. Again, where we're in this twilight between what's natural and what's hybrid or surreal or abstract or unnatural. <laughs> For me, it made more sense to use the pitch bender there, and you can't do that with a real instrument, but it just gives a little more sort of lead guitar-like quality. And you probably heard a lot of like, doo and risers, all our sort of normal signature hybrid sounds. And they're all coming from different volumes, our longs and falls and risers, just different volumes of hybrid libraries inside of sound paint here. Our fast downers, I love them. They're very sort of punctuating like doom, like very good for rhythmic markers. I like to use them sort of in very accurate rhythmic fashion. I think they become more a part of the music and they're really just there to sort of enhance the bigness of the sound. But then towards the very end of the piece, which is my favorite part, I was like, with samples sometimes, like, why do we always try to make them sound like what they are? Oh, it's a brass library. It has to sound like brass. So I deliberately took the opposite motion. I was like, okay, I'm, ha I'm gonna have to synthesize this to the degree that I don't feel as brass anymore, but I still feel a little bit of the soul of the brass, if you will. And it began with this sound here. And if you notice down here on the offset, you'll noticing that I'm moving the detail here. I associated that to my mod wheel so I could offset the staccatos here and the staccatissimos and the stop horns all together to make them more or less synthesized. The deeper I go into the sound, the more I'm cutting off the attack and it gives it that more synthy vibe. But as I'm sort of moving the mod wheel down here, I go back to more natural states and I sort of fluctuate back and forth between them and just try to build something again in that twilight zone where we don't know if it's real or not. So I thought that was cool, but then I was like, I want to add more of that. I want to give it more sort of arpeggiated feel, but I want the arpeggiators to sort of fluctuate pitch-wise between each other. So it's not just a da 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 but you also have other elements that are sort of moving around it, but with more natural pitch variation. Watch this little guy down here. So a similar sound, but playing a couple of octaves higher and then just basically using the pitch bender to create these sort of more natural fluctuations. I also added a little bit of a Juno arp to that, I believe. But then I was like, okay, cool. We have these fluctuating sort of arpeggiators, but I also want that sort of sonic stamp. So I took our Ramona UDS library here, which has some of the best modern, very, very analog and dirty kind of sounding mega horns or Brahms or whatever we call them. They've been running through real analog hardware and super enhanced. So you can really hear the natural sort of dirt and electricity in the sound. I say that because in the past, all the hybrid stuff was very digital and super well produced. But as we can see in movies now, and as we can see in music as well, there's a lot of new trends going towards having more organic and analog sounds. You want a little bit of dirt on the lens. You want a little bit of electricity from the real life into the sound as well. And if I isolate this sound here, it is so pretty. You can hear the analog compressor in real life. There's a sound, it's almost like a high sort of kind of sound at the top. That's a real compressor. That kind of like top squeeze. These guys are morphed. So when you play them on the keyboard, depending on how hard you click on the key, you're going to generate a different kind of version of it. So there's literally like 127 different variations on your keyboard. So super soft is like, I play a little bit harder. You can hear it's starting to change its character. Oh, what a 
cool sound. I thought it could be interesting to take you into this room here and play with all the non sort of multi samples, really get into the nitty gritty of the library and also show you how much we can process these samples inside of sound paint and make them into these new hybrid creatures. Sure, I could take you through all the individual parts here in the library and really play each of them individually, but I think you know already and have the idea what aleatoric brass is. So instead of just doing that, because you can see there's a shitload of parts here. Um, I thought it could be interesting to take you into the programs instead and show you what we can do with those parts. Sounds like almost like Christmas bells, like celebrating Christmas in like a snowy fantasy city. I love in sound paint that we have samples on every single key. It doesn't matter how deep I go, there's something to be found down here in the deep dark realms of the keyboard, places we shouldn't go to. There's no symphony orchestra unless it had like 2,000 players that could emulate what just happened right here. Isn't this fun? For me, like... Well, you notice here on the mod wheel that when I move it up and down here, I dial in the wide microphone so we get a little more of that sort of width in the hall. So cool, not that one. That was the call rip. One of the unique aspects about the library is also that we have our multi samples like we looked at in the DAW, and then we have all the crazy effect stuff, and then we have sort of things that are in between, for example, these falls. I love it here in the three parts. Um, Jimmy made one of them a little bit sort of pitchy here, which gives it a cool little bit synthy effect down here. Here is sort of a synthesized sforzando. I always have a hard time saying that word, sforzando, um, which is sort of normal samples, but also a little bit synthesized. And the same thing here, we have a more traditional sort of multi-sample. And then at the same time, we have all the sort of chatter. I think the multi-sample is the guy down here, if I just separate that. Oh, that's a nice trumpet. big, fat, octave-based Mikado samples. This next articulation is called Game Over, and it's a good example of the sort of standard sound in the library, if you will. There are hundreds and hundreds of these sort of motion parts in it where you could just do all these sort of... And if you notice, I play this without any sensibilities at all, and in many ways, that's sort of the dirty way the library was intended to be used. That was the 
Hall of Horns. So this one is called Heart Attacks for Sando, and it's because Shimmy combined a staccato note with a sforzando. Super sweet. Let me try to take the time module down here, click this guy up here. So now I'm controlling all four parts and let's try to speed it up here to twice as fast. So with the time module, you can control the length of the sound. It can be super fast. It can be a bit slower. It can be like normal speed. Or we can go slower. And that way, you can completely control the length of all your arcs, of all your sforzandos, even short notes can do it as well. Mercados, staccatos, all that stuff. It's such a wonderful tool. If you want it to be a little bit tighter, if you really want that crescendo hit right on your hit, you have full control with time. In fact, we can go down and make it almost eternally slow, or if we want, completely slow, meaning that we're standing still in time. We can also modulate that actually by using an attack here and have a ramp on it. So it's slowly gonna take time from normal and then go all the way down to this sort of glass-like sound. And it'll last forever. In this part of the engine, when you take speed all the way down here, it makes the sound into a loop itself. So even if you have a short sound, you can make it last forever. And it really allows you to sort of find pad-like qualities in sounds that are not sustained or paddy. Something foreboding and beautiful about that. And it's literally forever. This is completely time stretching all the way down to the part where it freezes. So it's a frozen sound, if you will. It's kind of cool. This next one is called Juno-like. And just like I showed you how you can make pads, but just using the time module here, you can also make it sound like a Juno 60. And while we're in the realm of falls, let me just take you through a couple ones here I made just with different kind of fall sounds. The number indicates how many notes. You can also go up. In this next one here, we're playing with the staccato programs I made them both for the horns, the trumpets, and the trombones here, so you have the whole ensemble laid out. <laughs> Having the trumpets up here. down to the horns and trumpets. And then slow just working down to trombones. But one of the most magical things we can do in sound paint is that we can morph between different parts. In this case here, I have a muted articulation and I have a non-muted articulation. In the old world, we had to crossfade between them, which is not really what happens in reality. Sounds don't crossfade, but sounds morph in reality. And that's exactly what we can emulate in the engine here. So you're gonna see me play from normal sort of round sounds all the way up to stop mutes here and with complete fluency on my mod wheel. Now, we can morph between different things, but we can also use microphones. Something I like to do is to add microphones to my mod wheel here. It sort of helps bring more like motion forward in the sound. Just something like this, just muted sounds, but with additional mics added here on the mod wheel.
So it's like I can sculpt the sound a little more. And if you imagine that in your music that you are not just sculpting the sounds with escalations, but you're sculpting microphones in your mix as well. How awesome is that? Bring the sound a little more forward. And in the computer, who says that we only have to do it the natural way? Sure, we can. We can keep our microphones completely separated, but we can also use them for more. You hear how beautiful and dynamic the sound becomes? That's just having fun with the mics. So this is a good example of one of the more classical aleatoric parts. In the bottom of the keyboard here, we go down and up here. So. It allows you to completely sculpt the sound. And again, if you need to sort of adjust how long that is, you can just go in and open our rack time module and manipulate the sound here. Let me move it up. Let me move it to the middle. Let me move it down. Real down. And that in itself is also a cool hybrid sound. This one. What a meat grinder. I love this one here. This is the Never Stable Bends by Shimmy. And what he did, which is ingenious, is that he took one of the parts here and reversed it. So we have these like atonal arcs, some going up, some going down. Because he's reversing one of the samples. You sort of meet in the middle. Down here. How cool that one can just like reverse reality that way. Straight back to the 80s. some bad sounding horns, but I like them. Oh no! One of the cool aspects about sampling is also that we can take the sounds that are natural and then just bend them just a tiny little bit to become sort of effectsy or aleatoric. And this one here, it's a traditional arc. It's beautiful. But once I take that mod wheel and move it up here, you'll notice here that the micro pitch over here goes up a little bit here and it just makes give a little bit of sort of a nerve or uncomfortable edge. It's not a lot. But it's enough to give it a little bit of like spice, if you will. Let me try to like take that. This is very sweet and very minutely done. Let's be a little more brutal here and really try to take the pitch and rip it apart. But because it's on the mod wheel, we can sort of go in and out on it. how uncomfortable the sound is. And here's another one of those sort of uncomfortable mod wheel movements. Oh, this reminds me about the soundtrack for Scarface. It has a little bit of that really, really like ancient 80s sound. Uh, so sweet. And you'll notice there's a lot of stuff going on. We got the chorus, which is what I thought it was, but I didn't notice the micro pitch up here as well, just creating more fluctuations in the sound. Very elegant. Love it.
so sweet because these things here, they are so sharp. <laughs> Really, really just tight and natural sounding. And time also works on these guys here. Not that they're not sharp enough, but if I take the time module here and I take the speed up, we're gonna get an even more sort of pointy staccato, spiccato kind of vibe. One of the beautiful things about the speed module you know, as well is that once we go up in time, the room will narrow down. So if you ever want a sound that is not sort of as roomy recording in a hall, but you want maybe somewhere in between where you have a warm studio sound, you can take time here and move it up as well. If I take it down here, kind of get a big hall, lush. So you can almost see sort of the room narrow. It's kind of like if you play like Fortnite or one of those sort of games, you'll see the map sort of shrink all the time. You'll see the room shrink around you. It's almost like a little bit paranoid. Maybe that's an electronic effect in itself. Just having a sound where the room gets tighter and tighter. But electronic brass is just like an endless rabbit hole of sonic explorations. There's not a lot more to say about it. I mean, if we go into the parts here, I could spend hours and hours just taking you through all these different guys here. There's three microphones for all the individual parts, but there's just too many to talk about. And for me, and this goes for sound paint as well, what we're really trying to do here is not just to have electronic brass in its conventional form. That's sort of what we did with ADO and Contact, but it's also to make new instruments out of it, mangle it in new ways and find a new way of making hybrid music by using all these tools, morphing and morphing microphone positions. We didn't even get into that. I touched a little bit upon that in my DAW demo here, but I just want to show it right here in the keys how much fun it is. We have a staccato and macado sound here. We've been there a million times before, but if I do something like, just take offset detail here, for example. I'm gonna go a little bit into the sound right here, and all of a sudden, I'm chopping off that staccato while leaving the macado alone. So it's very different from two. I add a filter to that as well, and all of a sudden we get this more sort of. You can add an arpeggiator to that. And all of a sudden, we have this magical sound. It's a little bit brassy, it has a reminiscence of brass in it, in its soul, but yet it's something entirely different. And we can strip it back to its basics. Let's take the offset down here. Let's remove the filter. And all of a sudden, we're sort of back in conventional brass world. But for me, with this particular one here, or at least the mood I was sort of looking for, I almost like the synthesized version more. That's a nice sound. I wonder, like, with the future of orchestral music, and I really just hope you guys do it, I'm definitely going to continue down this path here, to take the instruments and be faithful to their soul, but also make them into something entirely fucking new. As you can see, this is an endless exploration. Um, we got a couple of comments in the last video that we're talking too much and the videos are too long. So forgive me if this video has been too long and if I've been talking too much. Um, it's kind of just exciting for me to go back in time. This is over a handful of years ago. It's Colin and I recorded this, but just to go back and look at this beautiful sample gold. Cage has been used in thousands of movies and soundtracks and TV shows and Top 40, whatever. But now have it in this new version, this super powered version, and truly being able to form these new sort of true hybrid instruments. We've used the term hybrid for so long, it's sort of become de facto, but I think there's a new type of hybrid forming here where we can take advanced multi samples, but put them in this sort of middle landscape, in the twilight zone between what's natural and what's unnatural. It's um, artificial instruments.